thank, thank you. Best not to clap yet, because you haven't heard what I've got to say. Um, what I want to do is uh, just spend uh, about 25 minutes talking about what it is uh, that makes projects go well and what it is that makes projects go kind of pretty badly. Most pilots don't go anywhere. Um, they're mostly a waste of money. Uh, the country doesn't really scale up the things that we do as pilots terribly well. Uh, and I'd like to try and take some of the lessons we've learned from industry and apply them here, um, hoping that uh, we'll have some more pilot projects that'll do well for their audiences. Um, just a note of caution that the images in this are not copyright cleared for anything other than looking at here. So best to think, first of all, about the barriers. I'm going to give you my top 10 um, things to remember when you're running pilots. Um, understand what the barriers are for your audiences. Now, the, the end audiences are likely to be teachers or students, um, and the barriers for those people are likely to be some combination of cost, relevance, and ease of use. That's well known. Um, and in terms of digital inclusion uh, for the country, those are still the main barriers, with the main one now being relevance for the people who are excluded. But for the people who are going to produce this pilot, there's a whole lot of other barriers. So you've got some pilot project, some great scheme that you want to uh, um, devise. Uh, the people who are going to do it are they actually talented enough to do this thing? Because quite a lot of times, you sort of meet people who are just not quite up to it. And it's worth taking a step back and thinking, this is just never going to work. Do they have experience of some kind? So they might be very talented, but have they got some experience to be able to bring to bear? Do they have the resources? And most of all, are they a coherent group? Or can they be made into a coherent group? Because you can have lots of talented people who are all pulling in different directions, doing their own thing. So generally, these are the reasons why things fail. Um, and lack of talent is the one that nobody really likes to talk about. Next thing to remember, number nine on the list of priorities, is who is it actually that this pilot is trying to impress? It may be some combination of a teacher, students, head teacher, maybe a local authority, maybe the parents, maybe a broadcaster or, or the PR people who, who are going to sort of tell the public about this wonderful thing. It might be the EU or it might be sort of politicos. But generally, um, people don't face up to who it is they're actually trying to impress. And when academic institutions are involved in a pilot, the people they're mostly trying to impress, in my view, are their academic peers. And what you need in an academic paper and what you need to impress your academic peers is probably not what you need in order to scale up a pilot service for the general public, right? So things which involve universities are very difficult in terms of industrializing the product. I can see I'm going to be popular here. So number eight on the list of things to, to worry about are there are certain things when you're doing a pilot, an educational pilot, that you need to integrate well. And by integrating, it means you have to sort of bring everyone together at the same time, uh, as if you were making a cake right from the start. You don't sort of think at the end of it, oh, I might need some flour. You get it all together at the beginning. Um, and these are the things. And uh, each person in the audience here will have some sort of knowledge of these, these areas, and probably more than one. But they need to be brought together. And one of the things that stops projects like this doing really well quite often is that there's a confusion between what is project management and what is editorial leadership. This happens a lot in government projects, that a project manager is put in place to ensure that the, the project runs as it should and according to specification. But there often isn't a person that says, do you know, that's running just right, but it's just a little bit crap, isn't it? And why don't we do something else? Um, you need to know the difference between, is your project a very well-defined, very clear um, a Ferris wheel sitting on the south bank of the Thames, which takes people on a tour around it? Or is it a Millennium Dome, a 
which as Chirac said, <laughs> very nice, but what is it for, right? Now, these projects both largely went to time and budget. You know, some of the contents of the dome didn't, but the actual building itself did. Um, it did all the things that were in the specification, and yet one was a little bit crap, and the other's really good, <laughs> right? Now, in broadcasting, the industry that I've come from, there is an executive producer who, on behalf of the audience, says, do you know, that's great, this is fantastic, that's a bit crap, let's do more of this, right? Who is it in the pilot who's going to take that role? And if you don't have a person who can take that role, God forbid it's a committee, then the thing will turn out a bit crap. You have to make sure that everyone actually understands what the pilot is and what it's for. And that means, particularly, the technologists and designers who are going to be building the thing. Don't wait till the end to describe to everyone what this thing is. Uh, have what's called a sunrise meeting, where everyone gets to not only understand the pilot, but the background to it. As much knowledge as possible should be imparted so that people can really add to it and, and add their intelligence. Seems so obvious, doesn't it? That rarely happens. So you need to understand where your pilot fits in. Now, if you think of um, the, the administration side of uh, where pilots might happen in, in schools, you know, making schools run better or educational institutions, that, that's one thing. Uh, and there'll be a whole list of attributes that a pilot needs to have. Um, if you're thinking about a project that might have something to do with the educational chain and how people learn, then if you think of that chain, uh, and I, I'm not a, uh, a sort of theoretician, I'll just sort of look at it in the way that broadcasters or, or advertisers would here, that at one end of the chain you want to stimulate interest and at the other end of the chain you want people to create or do or have a change in their brains in some way. And in between, you need to go through some steps, which are to engage people, to guide people to resources, to enable brains to communicate, right? To, that's part of the process of, of learning. So you need to think about where it is on this chain, or if you have a different chain that you use because of your own theoretical backgrounds, where is it on the chain that your pilot sits? What is it that you're enabling people to do? What's the thing that you're underpinning, right? Now, if you use new technology cleverly, you might be able to enable those stages better. You might be able to lower the barriers between stages, so instead of having someone having to go physically from A to B in order to do something, they might be able to do it just here when they want to. You might be able to help to create virtuous circles. And, and by virtuous circles, let me explain. Um, there was a project we did for... Um, as, as part of a, a program in government called Culture Online, where uh, it was designed for people who are users of the mental health services. And uh, in their own terminology, mad people. Uh, this is a project with Sane and Mind and everyone else. And we did a project called Mad for Arts. Right? This, this is like the word queer. It's being uh, re retaken by the, the people in that group. Now, the, the, the sort of idea of the project is to... Uh, was, was to uh, enable people who class themselves as being mad <laughs> to um, give comments on art, architecture, and music, to become critics of art, architecture, and music. And that would be of interest both to so-called mad people and all the rest of us who are also so-called mad, at least some of the time. Um, and that, um, by, by doing that, they would be able to a, have a voice, B, learn new techniques, and also give something to everyone else that might be of interest. Now, the, so the, the galleries and museums around the country open their doors to people and enable, you know, with technology, enable people to contribute to a big website. Uh, the best material from the website appeared on the community channel, a uh, niche television channel, and the best material from that was transmitted before and after the main evening news on Channel 5 with a strong call to action for more people to take part. Now, the po important point there was that that virtuous circle of content, you give people the tools, they use the tools, that enables um, more people to see what it is that they've done, and that itself encourages more people to take part. 
means that broadcasters and media companies aren't necessarily in the role of PR anymore. They're actually integrated into the project. And that's very important. So think about, one, one of the things people don't think about enough in sustainable pilots is where the virtuous circle of content is going to come. Where is it that, how is it that users are going to encourage other users to take part? And that's a classic way of doing that. I almost lost it there, because I, I, just as, a, as an aside, um, I came up on that sort of weird Pendolino train that makes you feel sick <laughs> as, you, uh, as it turns around corners. And I, just about the second bullet point there, I started thinking I was going to collapse. Anyway, I'm, I'm all right now. Uh, <laughs> it's always better to tell people after the event than, than before. Right, OK. So um, the, one of the things you need to think about is whether uh, your project is going to help people to learn or grow or develop and how it is that you add, each person can add value for others. So choosing good measures of success is a uh, is, is top thing to do. Uh, you know, if you were measuring the success of a football team, would it be, we're going to measure the number of players. We're going to measure the cost per goal. We're going to uh, you know, measure the time taken to change shirts in between halves. You know, these, these are stupid things, but all around the world of pilot projects for education, you see really, really stupid measures. Right. Um, when I was at the BBC for a while, I was um, uh, in charge of BBC Online. And uh, my salary, uh, I managed to get linked ever so slightly to the um, growth in internet traffic of the BBC over the growth of the internet as a whole. So if I could make the BBC site grow faster than the internet as a whole uh, in terms of traffic, uh, I would get some sort of small bonus. Um, so the first thing I did, because the traffic was measured in page views, um, I made all the pages smaller. <laughs> so the audience had to click around all over the place. <laughs> Boy, did I do well out of that for about a week. Um, so, you know, the lesson here is really think about what the, you know, if you're going to have targets and, uh, you know, that's the kind of world we live in, Pick the right ones, for goodness sake. Page views are not a good target, generally, because they're not necessarily linked to what people are learning. And if it's learning that you want to impart, then learning is somehow what you need to measure, or at least attitudes to it. So number four, partnerships. When you're entering into a partnership, as many pilots are, um, uh, as many pilots are partnerships, you need to think about what each partner says they want. Right? So if you do a partnership with the BBC, they will say, I think we agreed this wasn't being recorded, they will say that they want um, you know, public service, doing good, uh, all, all the things, you know, reach and audience share and all of that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and if you want to do a partnership with a big museum or gallery, they'll say roughly the same thing. What they actually want is to do all those things but they'll also want some combination of political influence, power, limelight, and all money, right? Now, if you're the BBC, what you most want in the world is credit for what you do with the public. It's drummed into you. If you work at the BBC, they strap you into a chair, shine lights in your eyes, and every day they tell you all credit comes back to the BBC. Now, if you're an organization trying to do a deal with the BBC, that's a useful thing for you to know. If you're an organization doing a deal with an academic department of the university, there's some combination of these things that the university will want, right? Largely also credit and limelight, though probably credit and limelight in a different sphere from the BBC, so that might be still a good partnership. But it does tell you something when you start say, thinking about what people actually want, um, how it is that you're going to drive success. And most people want personal aggrandizement of some kind, so if you can organize that personal aggrandizement up front, um, and it might not even cost anything. Uh, that's a good way of making pilots work. Know everything you can about your audiences. Um, just a quick story about, the, uh, about General Motors, actually. You might not think that General Motors has much to teach this audience. Um, if you're designing cars, um, there are th some things that you know that people want, the public want, and you meet those needs. Uh, there'll be things that you, um, you can't meet their needs, but you know that they want all the same. Um, and General Motors found itself in the position 
of wanting to differentiate itself in the marketplace. So they knew that they, uh, they could ask people. They, the, the public would say, well, we want different speed of the car and we want different colors. They knew that at the time they wanted um, you know, cup holders and CD players and faster speed. This is a while ago. And they, at the time, weren't meeting those needs, but they knew they could, right? Um, and then there were things that the audience doesn't know about, but uh, the car manufacturers put in anyway, like crumpled zones and stuff, which most people don't care about. But what do you do about the things on the top right there where you're not meeting people's needs, and if you go and ask them what their needs are, they don't know, right? And that's a lot of new services fall into that category. What GM did was that they sent researchers to, um, to live in people's cars for about three weeks all over the United States. So you come out your door in the morning, there's someone in your car um, in the back, and they just observed for three weeks, and they all went back to base um, after three weeks, and they uh, compared their notes. And one of the things they discovered was that people were forever ordering flowers from, there, from in and around the car. Interesting thing, you know. Um, that they were worried about breaking down in a bad area, that they were worried about losing the keys to their car, uh, locking themselves out of it, um, and they were worried about not being able to find their car in a car park, which is probably the size of Europe, right? So those are the sorts of things that people were worried about, and on the basis of that, GM developed OnStar, which solves all those problems. With one bound, they were free, right? And uh, that was a very, very successful service for, OnStar, uh, for, for GM and differentiated them in the market, all based on observation. Um, at the BBC, when I was uh, running educational campaigns, uh, we had a campaign for uh, li basic literacy. And it, it was aimed at getting people who, were, who couldn't read or write um, to go and do courses. Uh, fantastically economically useful to the public. Uh, all the agencies said the big thing that we should go on would be embarrassment, embarrassment at not being able to read to your kids uh, and so on, and um, embarrassment at having to go into shops and, and sort of say, I've left my glasses behind, could you read this for me? That seemed kind of obvious to us, um, but we could all read and write. And when we went, as the advertising agency suggested, and lived for two or three days with families where people were functionally illiterate, uh, we all came back and compared notes, and we found something quite different, which actually it wasn't to do with embarrassment, it wasn't to do with inconvenience, it was to do with guilt. And we did all the things that advertisers would do and put you know, um, spots all across the schedule, which are absolutely focused, tear-jerkingly, emotionally, Hollywood-style, guilt, 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 um, to the point that you know, people were writing in to complain, not the target group, uh, they didn't complain. Um, 450,000 people responded to it. Now, what I don't know is how many people would have responded if we'd have done the usual thing, but I know that it was effective. And so don't take people's word for what the audience is like. Go and see them yourselves. Um, a word on new formats and services. The word is storyboard, right? Um, my, what I mean by that is uh, I don't expect you to be able to read the writing on this. In fact, I sort of prefer you didn't. But the... Uh, um, if, if you sketch out, not using a computer program of any kind, but just using pencil and paper, a storyboard, a cartoon, for how you think your new service will be used, right? So in this case, uh, we've got a couple of people watching telly, and then a teacher sort of uh, shows something in a classroom, and then this happens, they get some gear from somewhere, and then some stars turn up, and, you know, th there's a story here, right? A, a lay person should be able to look at the story with someone explaining it to them, saying this happens and then this happens and then this happens, and be able to understand it well enough to be able to say, do you know, I don't think they'd do that, or what if it's raining there, or uh, where do they get that from, right? It's a way of having people cluster around something and be able to comment on it without it being all sort of finely produced like a computer program would be, um, just sketches doesn't cost really very much at all, very, very cheap. Um, if I was a consultant, I, uh, or a cleverer consultant, I would have some sort of very expensive tool here. But all you need is pencil and paper and a group of people who can cluster around and say, would people do that at this time? So whatever pilot you do, just storyboard it, OK? Um, now, finally, number one, is something missing from this? You've got the content. You've got the technology. You've got the user experience. 
These are the things that we normally pilot, okay? And the reason that the pilots tend not to go anywhere is because they tend to test the wrong things. And the things that are not tested sufficiently are the business processes, right? I can see you're all slipping into a coma, so let me just um, explain what I mean. You know, a pilot is fine, and for academic research, it's brilliant, because all academic research is about kind of doing something new, publishing it, getting your name on it, it's fantastic, right? But actually, what the industry, and we are in an industry, needs are things that are scalable, sustainable, replicable, all over the country, scale it up, manage to fund themselves. These things are rarely tested, right? And you know, maybe we should do, every pilot should have a, an academic partner of the London Business School or LSE or Manchester Business School or something, right? Because these are the things that cause the pilots not to go anywhere. And it, since most of the time you just know that the pilots aren't going to go anywhere, then sometimes I wonder what's the point of doing in, in the first place, right? But the, these are the things that you really need to think about. Now, commercial companies spend very little time on the invention of new things and loads of time on these, right? Public service does it all the other way around. And government in particular, you know, a new minister comes in, wants to be associated with something new, new, new. Not very exciting if it's someone else's idea, not many votes in it, right? And they don't want to spend the time and effort looking at these things. So if you really want your pilot to go somewhere and you want to make a mark on society, that's the thing to think about. So just, I'll finish with um, just a few uh, sort of questions to ask. Um, and <laughs> a cultural resonance that some of you might spot here. Why is this project different from all other projects is the thing that you need to, uh, to ask yourself, right? That, that's the thing. And there are, of course, how many questions will there be? There will be four questions. So will more people learn better, right? I mean, that's one of the things that we're in business for. Will this save money? Will teachers or students be happier? And can this actually be done better without new technology, <laughs> right? And it's, it's worth asking, and the reason I have these, this is my litmus test, but the, the reason I, uh, I put those pictures up is because I went to a school recently where they were very proud of an online system to allow people to do litmus tests virtually. <laughs> and I just felt like slapping the teacher. Um, that's, that's probably not allowed, is it? But, uh, but there you go. Um, so uh, my final plea is, please, you know, meet your audiences, whoever you think they are. Um, fiddle with things, because it's by fiddling with things, um, by actually taking them up and playing with them, that you, uh, you learn what's possible. When I... Um, uh, became a television director for a while, it was only as a result of someone, when I was an engineer, um, putting a camera in my hands and saying, go out for half a day and make a, make a little film. And it, it's at that moment that I thought, oh, I hadn't thought about what might be possible here. So you need to sort of be familiar enough with the new technology, whatever it is, uh, just to be able to see what's possible. That doesn't mean you have to be proficient. And just be curious. Thank you. What chimed with me was the, the communication part of the process. That I tend to spend a lot of my time actually trying to convince people about a project and, and its aims and these sorts of things without being commissioned, if you, see, if, if you see what I mean. And I wondered if you wanted to expand upon that, because I think with the BBC process, it's probably kind of like, you know, you, you're looking for new ideas, whereas perhaps in our position, the academic kind of side of things, they're not necessarily looking for new ideas. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I mean, the BBC is looking for new ideas. It, it, um, uh, I spent three and a half years in, in um, the DCMS, um, which I think, you know, I mean, they were definitely not looking for new ideas, I would say. <laughs> God, sometimes you just wish you could claw back those words. But the, um, uh, and, and there are plenty of organizations that sort of want new ideas in certain sorts of new ideas, but not, not these ones. And the trick is to, first of all, you know, any group of people will need different ways of coming at things. You can't have a one-size-fits-all communication strategy about what it is that you want to do. You can't persuade everyone in the same way. Um, you know, we know that from our family life. You know, we, 
we want to take a trip to Paris, and different people need a little bit of kind of cajoling in different ways. This will be the advantage for you, this will be the advantage for you, you know, and eventually you get agreement. Uh, so that, that would be one thing. Second thing is think back to those uh, drivers, you know, in a partnership, and even if it's a partnership within an organization, there are people who will have different reasons for wanting to do things or not wanting to do things. So if you can get to those, and understand, it's, it won't be what they say they want, because what they say they want, you know, I mean, people are clever, you know, they'll, they'll say they want um, motherhood, apple pie, you know, better um, sort of uh, kudos for the university, or, or, you know, whatever. But, but what they actually want may be some of those things plus a whole load of other things. So you need to really think about what it is that's going to drive people. I don't know whether I've answered your question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Hi, um, that was great. Um, for me, the, the, the area you didn't cover was um, conflicting requirements and um, within projects, sort of the, um, the wildness of the art of the possible being turned into the, the practical delivery on time and to budget. And I'd, I'd just be interested in your comments about sort of change control and environmental influences and how you tame them. Yeah, the... the you see, there are two answers to this, and the, the professional answer is the one that's uh, all about all that change control stuff and Prince 2 and, you know, processes for changing things and, and, and so on. And that's all good, you know, and there are manuals on it, and it's fine, right? And yet, even with all those manuals, it kind of all goes a bit pear-shaped sometimes, right? And the, what you need is talented leadership, right? And if you haven't got talented leadership, do a different project. Find a different project to do. Um, it really is, you know, and, and that is one of the reasons why people sometimes don't want to do things, right, just to go back to your point, that, you know, I've, I've sort of, I like to think of myself as a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed person who's keen, keen on things. But sometimes someone comes along with a project and you think, God, that's a fantastic idea. That's really good. It would really help the public. It would really help my career. I'm, I'm up for this. And then I think, ah, oh, but look at the shit who's leading it. I mean, this is just, it's just, going to, it's just going to be awful, isn't it? And I'd rather put my time into something else and forget about that because life's too short. I mean, life is like that, unfortunately. And, you know, if you're talented enough, then go to another organization. You know, if you're mobile enough, that's, you know, I was sort of forced to do that because I only had short contracts around the place, so I had to go. But, you know, it's uh, sometimes you just take a step back and you just think, this ain't going to work. And you know who might be your greatest friend? The chief financial officer. You know, that, they're the people, she or he, you know, has to look after the money for the organization. And if you say, look, you know, I'm really not sure that this is going to be good value, then they'll probably take notice. I don't know, it's a sort of bit, it's a, you know, in, in public service organizations, in universities and um, governments, and, and government departments, there are kind of layers of politics that just sort of gets sort of slapped on everything, um, which uh, the politics is there in commercial organizations. It's just sort of more transparent. Um, and uh, I don't know, you just sort of, there's a, there's a sort of pragmatism, isn't it? You just have to sort of take a step back and think that ain't going to work. <laughs> there was a lady here. Jackie, one last question, OK? <laughs> Yeah, my question is about the, the I, the impact word, and you talked about um, success factors. Um, and I think there's a lot being driven by research councils and other bodies at the moment in terms of how do we measure impact. Um, I wanted to ask you not about the quantitative stuff, because we can do that, but about the qualitative stuff. Do you have experience of how you can sort of get that uh, qualitative, beneficial impact okay, so, successfully? So, so, right. Um, there are sort of two questions within that. Is one is, you know, if, if you could have a checklist of things that uh, would be it make for compelling experiences that people would want to tell their friends about and so on, what would be on that checklist? And there is a checklist, which I don't have time for, unfortunately, but there's six factors, you know, and you can go through them. And first, is it well-defined? Is it accessible? Is it, you know, transformative, significant? You know, there are, there are these things that, whether you're a game show designer or a, or, or a um, theme park designer or anything else, you should know about. Okay, and email me and I'll, I'll, I'll help you. Um, the, the other factor is, well, how do you know that the thing you've done has been impactful, right? 
And uh, one of the things that you can do is ask people. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, you, can, you can say, has this changed your life? You know, how much has it changed your life? Has it changed your life for the better or the worse? And you need to um, frame the questions in such a way that it's easy and more easy and possible for, you, for them to tell you negative things than positive things, right? So if, you want, if you're in a, a bank or a restaurant and you're giving service to people and you, uh, you, you say, how was everything for you, you know, when you're checking out of the hotel or what have you, the purpose of that is not to find out what it was like, right? Th that is no way to ask someone how, what, how you know, because ultimately they just want to get the hell out and they don't want to say bad things to you and, and they'll just say, fine, right? We've all been there. If you wanted to really find out, you would say, can you tell me the, the worst two things about this evening? Can you tell me what was the, uh, w w you know, if there was one thing about this restaurant meal that you didn't like, tell me what it is, right? And that way, you get a different kind of feedback. So it's partly in, I, I, you know, the, your question is so deep that I could happily, or very unhappily for the rest of the audience, uh, talk for an hour about it. But you know, there's a whole lot of things that you can do. But I'll just, well, just email. We have to end there, because we've sort of overshot our time only slightly. Thanks very much for a Thank really you. stimulating talk. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.